over there. Flash floods, storms and hail have destroyed Muscat City, making many people injured. Currently, we are still waiting for the report. Oman has been devastated by an abominable storm. Do you know what happened? Is this a wrath of God for those who don't have faith? In this episode, I will explain in more detail. Smash that thumbs up button for me, leave me a comment down below, and share this video with your friends. And let's get started. Under the firefly light of dim streetlights, the city of Muscat is gradually settling into darkness. Peace seems to have just become a new life after a busy day. But not everyone can enjoy this peace because a fierce storm is gradually approaching from the sea, bringing with it clear signs of unparalleled power. The first wind came from afar, gentle but powerful, making the windows shake and the still standing trees suddenly move like cosmic houses. The next moment, the sound of the wind was raised to a wild roar, shaking the sky. Then, small drops of rain began to fall from above, like sparkling gems in the light. Gradually, the rain became more dense, creating small streams on the streets, turning them into waterways. The fierce wind continued to grow stronger, strong gusts causing trees to bend and houses to shake under its destructive force. The sound of thunder echoed in the space like a warning from nature, warning of an upcoming war. Under the Under the bright light of the immense sun, the small city of Ibri, in the western mountains of Oman, seems to sleep soundly in the peace of the new day. But suddenly, nature's fury struck when a sudden flood rolled from the high mountains, flooding the Ibri Plain with unexpected ferocity. The flood created a horrifying scene. 
Brown, murky water from small streams and rivers poured into the city, carrying with it large and small rocks and tree branches, causing chaos and destruction. Roads turned into raging rivers, houses were swept away like fallen branches in the wind, and cars were swept away like dry leaves on the ground. In the chaos of the storm, tornadoes suddenly appeared, like giant water spouts from hell. These vortex columns orbit at breakneck speeds, engulfing everything within their diameter. These black vortexes claimed everything in their path, shattering all structures and infrastructure, bringing with them an indescribable sense of horror and fear. Under a grey sky, a sudden hailstorm appeared in Oman, bringing with it terror and destruction. Large and small stones fell from above like fire bullets, creating terrifying echoing and clicking sounds. The feeling of the stones constantly falling, causing people to run away and seek shelter. Huge rocks hit the ground, making loud noises and cracking hard surfaces. On roofs and cars, hail damage becomes apparent, causing damage and destruction. The consequences of natural disasters such as hail, tornadoes and storms in Oman are undeniable. Communities often face devastating losses to their lives and property. Homes are severely affected, trees are destroyed, roads are cut off, and essential infrastructure such as electricity and water may also be damaged. Civilians can also lose their lives or be seriously injured and loss of morale and self-confidence can also be a problem. Let us pray for Omen. May God be strong and merciful. We come before you in prayer, especially for the nation of Omen, whose communities are suffering from devastating storms and floods. May God look upon the people of Oman with his boundless mercy and love. Amen. One thing is very clear. All these natural disasters happened because of God's wrath. Why is God angry? God is angry because his children have done wrong. But if they know how to convert, God is ready to love and save them. Beloved faithful, we must confront an unsettling reality. Not everyone in this world can or will be rescued. This truth serves as a warning, particularly to people who faithfully attend church services. It is not only attendance at Sunday services, active participation in the community, tithing, holding a Christian title, speaking piously, or even baptism that ensures salvation. The Bible's Matthew 7.21, 22, contains Jesus' strong warning regarding the Day of Judgment. 
Many will believe they accomplished miracles in his name, but he will reject them, saying, I never knew you. Depart from me, you evildoers. This message invites each of us to ponder on our genuine situation before the divine throne on Judgment Day. Consider this. If the Lord returned today, would we be ready and worthy, clothed in His righteousness and spotless before Him? This is not only necessary to consider, it is also critical to our spiritual development. Today, we will reveal the four types of people who are not saved. The first group consists of unbelievers. But who are they? They deny the Lord Jesus Christ's birth, death, burial, and resurrection. According to the Bible, these persons cannot be saved. The only way to redemption is through faith in God. Without this belief, no one can be redeemed from sin and Satan's power. There is no other way to be saved except through faith in God and belief in His Son, Jesus Christ. The well-known phrase in John 3.16 emphasizes that God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. Many people may underestimate the simplicity of the redemption plan, which is why belief is so hazardous. Second, God cannot save individuals who seek salvation from sources other than Jesus Christ. According to John 5.40, some refuse to come to Jesus for life. He is the sole way to the Father, and no one can get there other than through Him. According to Acts 4.12, Jesus Christ is the only name given among men by which we must be saved. Nothing else can save a person, not intelligence, power, money, beauty, or even family and friends. We are redeemed solely by Jesus' blood, and His death on the cross atoned for our sins. The next group of people who, according to Scripture, cannot be saved are hypocrites. In Matthew 23, 3, Jesus explicitly chastised these individuals, saying, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, hypocrites! You shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You will not enter, nor will those who attempt. A hypocrite is someone who falsely claims to be something they are not. On Sundays, they dress appropriately for church and raise their hands to God. On weekends, however, they behave in the same way as everyone else in the world. For them, salvation and the life of faith are merely formalities, and the church is treated as a social center rather than a place of genuine devotion. According to the scriptures, the last group of individuals whom God cannot save is the dead. Many people seek out pastors and religious leaders for prayers during a loved one's funeral. However, it is critical to recognize that no prayer may alter a person's fate after death. Salvation is only achievable while alive. Once dead, it is absolutely unattainable. Some feel that the idea of purgatory is not backed by God's word. Salvation is only attainable in this life, which is why it is critical to give your life to Jesus. Friends, I hope you understand that some people may not be saved. This is not due to God's lack of love, but rather because He cannot compromise His standard of justice in order to save someone. God's greatest act of love was sending His Son to die for us on the cross at Calvary, even though we were still sinners. If someone decides not to believe following this tremendous sacrifice, God will not compromise His beliefs again, and God will certainly return to us. The second coming of Jesus Christ is the hope of believers that God is in control of all things and is faithful to the promises and prophecies in His Word. In His first coming, Jesus Christ came to earth as a baby in a manger in Bethlehem, just as prophesied. Jesus fulfilled many of the prophecies of the Messiah during His birth, life, ministry, death, and resurrection. However, there are some prophecies regarding the Messiah that Jesus has not yet fulfilled. The second coming of Christ will be the return of Christ to fulfill these remaining prophecies. In His first coming, Jesus was the suffering servant. In His second coming, Jesus will be the conquering king. In His first coming, Jesus arrived in the most humble of circumstances. In His second coming, Jesus will arrive with the armies of heaven at His side. 
The Old Testament prophets did not make clearly this distinction between the two comings. This can be seen in Isaiah 7, 14, 9, 6, 7, and Zechariah 14, 4. As a result of the prophecies seeming to speak of two individuals, many Jewish scholars believed there would be both a suffering Messiah and a conquering Messiah. What they failed to understand is that there is only one Messiah, and he would fulfill both roles. Jesus fulfilled the role of the suffering servant, Isaiah chapter 53, in his first coming. Jesus will fulfill the role of Israel's deliverer and king in his second coming. Zechariah 12.10 and Revelation 1.7, describing the second coming, look back to Jesus being pierced. Israel and the whole world will mourn for not having accepted the Messiah the first time he came. After Jesus ascended into heaven, the angels declared to the apostles, Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Acts 1.11 Zechariah 14 4 identifies the location of the second coming as the Mount of Olives. Matthew 24.30 declares, At that time the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and all the nations of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. Titus 2.13 describes the second coming as a glorious appearing. The second coming is spoken of in greatest detail in Revelation 19.11, 16. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Many Christians look forward to the second coming of Jesus Christ back to earth, where he is expected to rule for one thousand years. As it draws near to the end of the ages, the church continues to live in great expectation and anticipation of the soon coming King, who is Israel's Messiah and the Saviour of the Gentile race. The second coming of Jesus and the church's rapture are separate events. We should not confuse one with the other. Many Bible scholars say the rapture will happen before the Great Tribulation, and Christ will remove his church to protect his people from the evil unleashed on the earth during the Antichrist's reign. Other Christians believe that the tribulation will take place before the rapture. These two events are expected to occur before the second coming of Christ. The Master's second coming will happen seven years after the tribulation period. The prophet Daniel in the Old Testament had a peek into the future when he saw a little of what will happen just before the one zero 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 year reign of Christ. Daniel 12, 1, 3. The Lord Jesus' second coming will be to rule bind Satan for 1,000 years and defeat the Antichrist by throwing him into the lake of fire. Pastor David Jeremiah states the following differences between the rapture and Jesus' second coming. At the rapture, Jesus will return for his saints. At the second coming, he will return with his saints. At the rapture, Jesus will not descend to earth. At the second coming, he will descend to the Mount of Olives as a prelude to his earthly reign. At the rapture, Jesus will bring a blessing to his saints. At the second coming, Jesus will bring judgment to those who have rejected him. The rapture could occur at any moment. The second coming will occur seven years later. During the millennium, Jesus will reign and rule for 1,000 years on earth after his second coming, and Satan will have no say whatsoever in anything about activities in the world. 
there will be a new heaven and earth, and people will live in peace and harmony. The new heaven and earth. God will give us will be known as the new Jerusalem. Everyone in the new Jerusalem will live and reign with Christ. Revelation 20, 4. The one, zero, zero, zero year reign with Christ will be a joyous time for the saints. Why did Jesus say the kingdom of God had come? Jesus declared the kingdom of God had come because he was trying to let the people know that the Lord God was ruling in their midst. Many Jews in those days were expecting and eager to see the kingdom established through violence and bloodshed. They were looking for a king who would come and defeat the Romans once and for all. However, they did not realize that the real king was already in their midst because he was teaching and preaching it to them. Jesus was carrying the kingdom of God in his heart. Everywhere he went, he shared it with those he came into contact with. The mighty acts that Jesus did were also living testimonies that the kingdom of God was in operation in the midst of the people. As Jesus walked among the Jews, apart from teaching and preaching about the kingdom of God to the people, he conducted many healings, signs, wonders and miracles. Many people that saw the miracles of Jesus were amazed. One day, while out in the boat with his disciples, a frightening storm arose so that all the disciples were sore afraid. The disciples feared for their lives and woke Jesus, who was asleep. When Jesus awoke, he rebuked the storm and the waves. Immediately, the storm calmed. The disciples in the boat saw what he did and said, What kind of man is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Matthew 8.27 NIV The Lord's mighty acts that he did while physically here on earth were all proof that the kingdom of God had come to a dark and dying world. Acts 2.22, 1 Corinthians 4.20 Did Jesus know when the second coming would arrive? When the disciples asked about the end of the age, Jesus replied that no one except God the Father knew its day or hour. Matthew 24.36 when Jesus described the end of the age, he included details that many scholars identify as the rapture. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Matthew 24, 40. If the rapture comes before the second coming and only God the Father knows when it will happen, we can assume that Jesus does not know when the rapture or second coming will occur. Only God the Father knows of such matters. In due course, he will pass on this information to his son. Do we know when the second coming will take place? As stated earlier in the text, no one except God the Father knows when the second coming of Christ will happen. We are given hints in the scriptures concerning this great future event, but no definite date. We remain in the unknown concerning these two great events. How can we prepare for the second coming of Jesus? We can prepare for the second coming of the Lord by doing the following, by drawing closer to the Lord. Spending quality time with God in prayer and fellowship with the Lord is one of the greatest ways we can prepare for the Lord's second coming. Prayer will bring us into a close relationship with our Creator and create a desire to stay close to Him. If we remain close to the Lord, the second coming will not catch us unaware or unprepared by reading the scriptures. Each time we read the word of God, we are drawn closer to the Lord because of the power residing in the scriptures. In addition, as we read the word of God, we will receive directions about how we can live right and prepare for his second coming. By living holy, living a life of holiness will please the Lord. Without holiness being evident in our lives, we will not be prepared for the Lord's second arrival. Holiness must become a lifestyle for us to live out in our everyday lives if we are to live and reign with Christ. By keeping our focus on the Lord, our focus must be on the Lord if we want to remain on high alert for the coming of the risen Saviour. The devil intends to cause us to lose focus so that we become too busy, confused, discouraged and even go off course. If the devil can cause those bad things to happen to us, he stands a good chance of causing us to miss out on Christ's second coming. We will be so busy trying to find happiness in our own strength 
that we won't depend on the Lord to help us. We can easily lose our zeal to continue serving the Lord, which will ultimately cause us to miss out on the Lord's second return. By loving and forgiving each other. The Bible says that love covers a multitude of sins, 1 Peter 4, 8, and that God the Father will not forgive us if we don't forgive others, Matthew 6, 15. If we cannot love and forgive each other, we are in big trouble with God and cannot be a part of the one, zero, zero, zero year reign with Christ. Love is the ingredient that keeps us together. Without it, we will become cold towards one another, quarrelsome and unforgiving. As the clock continues ticking and we draw closer to the end of the age, we should live in holy readiness, knowing that the coming of the Lord is near. Back in the mid-1990s, a popular radio talk show host on an Oklahoma City secular station interviewed me live on the air via telephone. He had seen an article I had written about the financial accountability of Christian ministries, and he had liked it. He began the interview by graciously giving me the opportunity to talk non-stop for about 10 minutes about the way God had transformed my life and called me into the ministry. We then moved on to a discussion of the scandals that had recently rocked the Christian community nationwide, the unmentionable word. Everything went well until the host asked me to summarize the fundamental message of my ministry. I responded by saying that God had called me to proclaim the soon return of Jesus in wrath. Before I could proceed with my explanation, the announcer cut me short. What do you mean, wrath? he asked. I mean that Jesus is going to return very soon to pour out the wrath of God upon those who have rejected God's love and grace and mercy. Your God is a monster God, he snapped. He then added, I happen to be a Christian, and I can tell you that my God wouldn't hurt a flea. That was the end of the interview. He hung up on me. I was not given an opportunity to respond to his misrepresentation of our Creator, Satan's grand deception. The radio host's vehement response to the wrath of God did not surprise me. It is characteristic of both Christians and non-Christians, and I have encountered it many times. Satan has sold the world a bill of goods concerning the nature of God. Most people, both Christian and non-Christian, tend to view God as being a sort of cosmic teddy bear. They see him as big and warm and soft, full of infinite love and forgiveness. He couldn't hurt a fly, and he certainly wouldn't be so cruel as to condemn or harm any beings created in his own image. On the day of judgment, God will simply give everyone a big hug and wink at their sins. The only problem with this wonderfully comforting image is that it is a lie straight from the pit of hell, the true God. Yes, the Bible teaches that God is loving, patient, caring and forgiving. Psalms 86.15 and John 3.16. As the Apostle John put it, God is love, 1 John 4.8. Two of my favorite passages in the Bible emphasize the personal loving nature of God. One was penned by the Apostle Peter. In 1 Peter 5, 6, 7, he says that we are to cast all our anxieties upon God because he cares for you. That is a very comforting thought. The other passage that I love to read over and over consists of words spoken by the prophet Jeremiah in Lamentations 3.22, 24 RSV. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. But the Bible also clearly teaches that there is another aspect of God's character that is equally important. It is the aspect that Satan wants us to ignore, and he has been very successful in prompting ministers to overlook it. Thank you for watching, and stay tuned for the next video.